Hi everyone, my name is Sebastian and I'm going to talk about overloading the member access operator and this is something I did last fall so I've been working at Google since February this was before that. So just to be clear I'm not talking about the error operator or the indirect member access operator I'm talking about the direct member access operator this guy because the error operator we already can overload that one it would be boring we want to do fun stuff so this presentation is in two parts um, in part one I'm just going to talk about this as a language feature and in the second part in the shorter part I'm going to talk about the implementation in Clang um, so the first part is completely neutral it's just about the feature itself so why would we don't want to do that, right? Um, I've got some use cases where you would want an overloaded dot operator, right? So the first one is boost flyweight. Who here has used or knows boost flyweight? Right, not a lot of people. So what is boost flyweight about? Say you've got an HTML snippet and you want to parse that and you want to represent it in memory, right? So the thing about this code, uh, about this data, is that there's a lot of repeated stuff, right? You've got the element names. It's the same or it's, I don't know, 10 different elements in a, in a huge web page, right? And the attribute names, they're all the same. So if we have a structure that represents the, such an element, right? You've got the tag name and you've got a map from attribute names to attribute values then there's a lot of wasted space possibly, right? So boost flyweight makes it very simple to avoid this wasted space, right? We just change the struct to this. We wrap the things that keep repeating with a flyweight. And flyweight takes care of internally, if you assign a value to a flyweight, internally it looks that value up in a global map and then just keeps it pointed to that one unique value. So every element with the same name internally points to the same string, right? So if we do this cha code, uh, code change in our code, what do we have to do then to make the entire code still work, right? We have code like this. This still works, right? Um, flyweight overloads all the operators and forwards them to the, to the inner object. So you can still compare this to a string literal because flyweight just overloads equals operator, forwards it to the string, and you actually compare the contained string against the string literal. Um, the one thing it cannot forward is member functions, right? This won't compile anymore. Flyweight doesn't have a size member function. It cannot forward size to string, because what if you instantiate a flyweight of int? int doesn't have a size member function and it cannot, it cannot have every possible member function and forward them all to the inner type. So here's how you do it. It has a get member function. It returns a reference to the contained object and you you'd call get and then call the member function on the internal stuff. And we don't want that actually. I mean <laughs> suddenly it's not no longer just a drop in. You have to change the code that uses member functions and add this get everywhere, right? So if we want that, we have to overload this guy. We have to overload this guy just as the other operators and forward member access to the, to the inner object, right? So this is what we want to do. We want to take the member access on our object and flyweight and push it to the string. We want to access that. Um, second idea. These libraries. Anyone has used those? Right. <laughs> um, here's some C++ 98 code using boost mind. Right? I want to have a functor that you give it a vector and an element and it does a pushback. It pushes the, the, the element into the vector, right? Yes? Will that compile? It will compile in C++ 98. Yes, excellent question. It will not compile in C++ 11. Sorry, yeah, um, oh, yes? I, I'm still thinking of the same thing. From the standard says you cannot take address in the standard libraries, the standard function, because there can be overloads. And, uh, oh, so you're saying uh, I cannot take the address of a standard, of a standard library function because there might be overloads. 
all right, even worse. So this might not compile even in C++ 98. So I thought it would compile. Um, it probably will compile in pretty much every library. It's not portable, right? And it's definitely not portable to C++ 11 because in C++ 11 we have two overloads of pushback, one with a const L value reference and one with an R value reference. So if I want to do that in C++ 11, what do I have to do? I have to do this, right? So I have to disambiguate this thing to say, yeah, I want the version that takes the construct. And I actually think I got that wrong because I think that pushback returns a reference to the newly inserted element. Okay. No? Just, Just void. Okay. Um, so now, <sighs> right. Um, what if I want actually to push back into a deck of doubles? Right? I've, I've got three times in this expression, I've got the type, I've got vector of int vector of int and int. If I want to deck of doubles, and three places have to change, right? Okay, let's see what we can do better here. Um, C++ 11 has lambdas. I can do this. Now it will compile, it will do the right thing. Um, this is a lot better, right? I still have to type twice. Okay, C++ 14, as it's coming, we have generic lambdas, right? This is pretty good. Um, it's short, it's to the point, it does what I want, always. Um, it's still some syntactic overhead. Uh, what do we want to do this? Right? I want to bind, I want a bind expression that has two arguments and it calls pushback on the first argument and passes the second. Here's a dot operator, we want to overload it. So in this case, we cannot just say, okay, here's a member access and we push it to another object. We, at this point, we don't know the type of this because this is fully generic. I can put a list, a DAC, a vector, any, co any container that has pushback here, right? So I want to store the member access and only when this bind expression gets called, then I want to access the memory inside, right? So. One is immediate forwarding to another object, one is delayed. And then there's something completely different, right? Uh, JSON. Here's a snippet of JSON, right? It's a very common data format. You have an object and the object has properties and each property has a value and the value might in turn be an object or it might be an array that contains more objects, right? Um, JSON is derived from the JavaScript object notation and so naturally in JavaScript using that is very natural, right? You parse, you parse the, the JSON snippet and then you just say everything dot question dot calculator, you just follow the uh, object tree down, right? Um, in C++ this can be pretty nice, but not that nice, right? Uh, you have to use the indexing operator and pass a string. Not too bad, but how about this? Why not do the same thing as in JavaScript? Well, here's a lot of dot operators that we would have to overload. So this is the third thing that I want to do. I want to take the name that I use here and not not access ac an actual member in another object. I kind of want to use that name for something else. I want to use it as string. Uh, yeah, so I want to have this identifier and then suddenly it's a string and how. Okay, so overloading the dot operator is not exactly a new idea, right? Um, I don't know how many of you have read Design and Evolution of C++. Um, Bjarne Struestrup actually talks about this. Um, basically, here's the error operator, right? And you overload it. It's an unary op it's a unary operator. You have this as a member function and you return a different object. And the compiler then kind of turns this x arrow foo, sorry, that's wrong here. x arrow foo turns into x dot operator arrow and on the result it uses the error operator again. So you can forward to a different object. This is how smart pointers work. And when they designed this, they said, hey, let's do the same thing for dot. 
right? So x dot foo is turned into x dot operator dot, and on the return value of that object, you do the member access. So name lookup just looks into that return value. So this is actually good enough to implement the flyweight use case, because if I want to overload here, I have a flyweight object, and I want to overload this dot. Well, I have this class flyweight, and at some uh, flyweight of t, and at some point I have this operator dot, and it returns this t. It returns the const reference to this t, and now if I do the name dot size. The compiler will say, okay, hey, wait a moment, flyweight's got an operator dot, so uh, we call that, the return type is standard string, um, and standard string has a size, right? So it's the flyweight dot operator dot, and the string size member on the result. Perfect. Let's look at this one. Uh, so underscore one will in most bind implementations be a, an instance of a class called placeholder or something like that. What do I return here? I don't know the type yet, right? At some point later, I will call this thing and pass in an object. But at this point, I don't know yet what that is. Especially, I don't know at the point where I define placeholder, I have no idea what's going to be passed for underscore one. I don't know what type will, there will be there. So I can't do that. And I can't do the JSON thing either, right? This, this method of overloading does not give me access to the name I'm actually accessing. So this way is it's simple, it's pretty easy to implement, and it can do one of the three ideas that I had. So that's not good enough. We want some more, and we want this name. We want the name that we're accessing as an argument. That We want the dot operator to be binary, right? Left side is the object we are accessing, right side is the name. Um, pass the name right, like that, right? No. We need the name at compile time. We want to use that name and then access a member of the same name in another object. We cannot do that at runtime. So a runtime param parameter is not good enough for that. <laughs> um, Let's do it differently. If we want a compile time para parameter, how do we do that? Put in a template parameter. A template parameter, exactly. Like this. It doesn't have any runtime arguments, but it has a template argument. And it gets this name as a template argument. Now, what do we put for those question marks there, right? Um, any ideas? What could we put there? Something similar to initialize a list. We get the initialize the initialize list for uh, Kind of the name that is accessed as some special kind of type, right? Or? or? Well, you can regard my answer as a joke. Uh, char character, char, and name dot dot dot. Yeah. Uh, a variadic argument of char, right? You kind of pass as a sort of string yes, the name. Yes, that's an option, right? Um, so I didn't go that way because that's annoying to work with. So, but this, a string is a good idea, right? So there's basically two ways we can do that. We can pass something that is an identifier or something that is a string. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Um, an identifier is simpler, right? String is, it opens this huge can of worms. like. <sighs> Identifier is it's, it's, it's much more limited, um, which is an advantage in understanding. Of course, it's a disadvantage when it comes to what we want to do with that thing. Because, let's face it, string template arguments, we, we want those anyway, right? Whether or not we overload dot, we want string template arguments. Oh, I, I know some people who want that. <laughs> um, so, Strings already exist, right? If I want to pass, explicitly use that as a template argument. Strings already exist, I have string literals. <laughs> if I want to an identifier, I have to invent new syntax that says, don't look that up, but actually use that identifier as is, something like escaping of to, in Lisp, right? Like the, like the tick in Lisp, 
to escape something. And the last point is, I'll get to that. And if I, have, if I pass identifiers as entities, then I don't have any problems with operator names. With the strings, I have problems with operator names, and I'll, I have a few slides about that. OK. So I introduced a new thing here, t-string. I didn't use char arrays um, for various reasons. Uh, in particular, char arrays are not complete types. So you don't want to say um, char array of how many elements, right? How many elements are in the name? Well, it depends on the name. So I introduced something completely new. Underscore, underscore t string is a new built in type that says, I'm a compile time string. And if you have that, you can, you can do everything you can with any other template with that. So now, if I do x.foo, the compiler translates this into x.operator. Dot passes the name as a string, as a template argument, and calls that. And the result is the member or whatever pass for that. Any questions about that? Is it clear? Eric? What exactly is member type? Member type would be the return type of the operator. Uh, the question is, what is member type, right? So the operator dot has to somehow decide, OK, what is the type of the member with the name? And it, ha it returns that type. So we usually, the next slide should, should give you an example for that, right? But I mean, in, in the case of the bind, where you have underscore one dot pushback, yes. what you want is something kind of polymorphic, right? Because you don't know yet what underscore one is going to be replaced with, be it a vector or a, or a Q or whatever. Yes. So there is no one return type here that actually makes sense for it. All of that. So the comment was in the case of the underscore one dot pushback that I had in the bind example earlier. What is the return type? Uh, I think that's the slide after the next. Um, so I'll get to that. But short answer is it's an expression template node. Um, okay, so let's look at that. What do you, I can do with that? So in the case of the JSON example, I have let's say this JSON represents a JSON object. And before I could overload operator dot, I had this operator, this index operator, and you pass it the name. That was the first slide I showed for C++, where you do index and string, pass the key as that. And I have this operator dot, and it just returns another JSON object, and it just forwards to this one. So it calls its own index operator and passes name, and the name is automatically converted to a runtime string. David? Um, have you thought about the, the shift in the semantics to where now we have you know, the dot and the thing that can go after it is now usually expected if the name's missing, it's going to be a compile time error. But here, if the, main, the name is missing, you have a runtime error. So have you, um, have you, did you have any thoughts about that implication of this? Do I have any thoughts about the implication that now Whatever I put after the dot will just be passed as a string and not produce some error like I couldn't find this member, right? Yes, I have. This, this has some implications. Um, and I have a few slides about that. Um, sometimes you get an error further in if you then try to access that as a member somewhere else. You get an error there. Sometimes, well, if it's converted to a runtime string and looked up, then you'll just get a lookup failure here and not much you can do about that because you don't know until runtime which members the chase and block that you loaded actually has, right? Well, right, but, it, but in a sense, like in the JSON example here, yes. you're expecting your JSON to be in a, in a particular schema. Yes. And you have better compile time type safety if that schema was you know, part of your compilation model. So I'm, I'm comparing this to a library where you would have the schema to find it compile time, and mm -hmm. it seems like that would give you better guarantees. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I, would I, in the case of JSON, if I had a schema somehow at compile time defined, how would I validate the names against this? Well, I could put a static assert here, 
that my somehow at compile time defined schema actually contains that name, right? I can do that. I, this is a real compile time argument. I can do any template meta programming trick you want with it. Anything, right? Did you have a different question? Normal people don't think A dot B can re reduce a runtime error, right? <laughs> Normal people don't know that dot. That's exactly the thing, right? <laughs> I'm not pretending any of this is normal. <laughs> um, yes? Sorry. I just, the the uh, signatures of the operators is just a little funny because <coughs> you're not returning by reference. I could return by reference if I wanted to. Um, this is just a silly example. If I really was where to implement the JSON library, I'd probably do it differently. Like return here some object that could represent, wait, that name is not there. But so if you assign to me, I'll create it. So yeah, I know, um, this is just an example. Okay, um, use case proxy, right? The flyweight thing. Um, so I have this data proxy type, and I want it actually to access any member, I want it to forward any member access to that inner object. So what does my operator dot look like? I have a template, it gets a name. Um, what does it return, right? How do I access, how do I use this name to access a member of T? This is what we need. We need to use to, to, to have a way to use a T string to access a member, to turn it into a name lookup. And I thought, well, it's kind of an indirect access into that other object, and we have an indirect member uh, access operator. It's called dot star. So do it like this, right? So currently dot star uh, takes a member pointer on the right hand side. Now it can take alternatively a compile time string. And this is turned into a name lookup. This is turned into a normal member access. Um, and this works, right? Given this, I can, this code is valid. Right? I have a struct foo. And then I have an object fp of data proxy of that foo. And any member I access in that proxy accesses the data member of that foo instead. Clear? Any questions? Yeah? Let's say, can you go to the previous slide? Let's say this class actually has a, a data member, say, like empty. That, you know, when I, when I write x dot empty, I actually want this member call, not the empty in, 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 in t. So I assume you, I would need to specialize the operator. So the question is, how do I access actual members of data proxy? And that's a big topic that always has always been a big problem with overloading the dot operator, and I have a few slides on that later, right? Uh, if T is a, another data proxy, yes? Do I want, like, I wonder if you could just do T dot name instead of T star name. Um, okay, if T, if itself is a has, a, has the dot operator overloaded, this will call that dot operator because this is turned into a member access and that member access in turn uses the dot operator. So you can chain this thing. Do you even need the star? Or I mean, you need the star because if you don't put the star here then it will try to look up a member called name in T. I have to tell it, you, you shouldn't look up a member, if this is just t.name, then it will search for a member called name. I want it to search for a member that has the name that is in that string. Uh, there was another question. Chandler. So, how do you represent calling a member? How do you represent calling a member? Excellent question. Yes. Excellent question. Um, Wait a few slides, and I have a lot of slides about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Yes. So, have you actually implemented this? Yes. I have an implementation of this feature. And I'm, this is the second part I'm going to talk about the implementation itself. 
Um, right. So next, uh, escaping is a big problem that was mentioned. Another interesting problem is when is this dot operator actually used, right? So in the old system, every, every member access was redirected through that operator dot, implicit or explicit. So what's an implicit member access? An implicit member access is, for example, if I write A plus B, then A might be an object that overloads operator plus as a member. And that's a member access. It's an implicit member access because there's no explicit member access operator. The old system just said, OK, if that A has an operator dot, then I take the return type of that. And in the result type, I look for an overloaded plus there. Um, so every, every, every member access was, was redirected. In my new system, I can't do that. And I'll explain why. So in my new system, I only redirect explicit member access. So let's assume we have these two structs, right? Um, you have a struct Y, and it has a member access operator that always returns int. And it overloads the plus operator, and it overloads the conversion operator. And we have this struct X, right? It has a data member, and it has a member function. It also overloads the dot operator. So that member function looks like this. Which of these accesses should be redirected through the dot operator, right? So this one is pretty obvious. It's obviously dot. So we want to redirect this. This becomes y operator dot pass abc as, as a string, and you're fine. Second line. So we have a pointer to y. Um, we, we want this, right? This is equivalent to dereference the pointer dot abc. So it should go through the dot operator, Tony. Unless I overload error myself. You can't overload error because this is a built-in type pointer. All right, okay. Um, so we want that too. I think it would just be kind of confusing if it wasn't. So here's this, yeah, sorry. It doesn't matter because this is a pointer to y. Um, this is not a y. If I said y arrow abc, then the overloaded arrow would be used. So that one is pretty It's not about, uh, yeah, the question is what if y overloads both dot and arrow? Wait, which I, I got it. That's an implicit one. It's, uh, yeah, if, 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 if there was an arrow, that would be an implicit yes. access because it's not a dot or arrow to something. but. Um, right, third line. I have y plus 5. So what does it mean? It can mean two things. There might be a global or a built-in operator plus. And I pass y as the left, left uh, as the first argument, 5 as the second. Right? Um, y has a conversion to int. This would actually work. Or I use the member operator of y. But if I want to look if the compiler is supposed to look for a member of y called operator plus, then it would find the dot operator and do this, right? It, y dot operator dot pass the plus operator as the name, call that, and pass 5 to the result, because this part is this, and then we call that with 5. But operator dot always finds something. So suddenly I have every possible member overload, that, every possible operator overload. That's... That's <laughs> it might not stop, because why not call operator dot and pass operator dot? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's assume we don't do that. <laughs> uh, but even so, it would be confusing and unexpected. So, no. That, that one will actually call the, the member operator plus that y defined, and not the operator dot. Next line. This, what does this mean? It means there is, we try a user-defined conversion from y to int. And suddenly, okay, well, 
Does it have, does it have a member called operator int? Hmm. Yo, yes, it does. It has operator dot, and we can give it this string and uh, every possible conversion. It doesn't matter. Yay. No. No, please, please, please don't do that, right? We don't want the compiler to do that to our code. Uh, David. But can you use your, your templates to restrict what the operator dot is going to allow and have it eliminate those functions? Yes, we can. We can restrict. We can say, okay. If, um, right. Um, question is, can we use template metaprogramming, Sfine or something like that, to restrict what strings we accept? Yes, we can. No, we don't want to. Because it would default to allow everything, and every time we would have said, oh, but not that one. Well, but, but why are these special function names yeah. special? Like, why not? Why isn't foo? Why, why are special function names special? It's not the special function names that are special, it's the special usage that is special, right? These, it, it, it's an easy rule to... So, if I do every member access and say, okay, this is this go through operator dot, that brings problem. So the easiest rule is, well, only do it on ex explicit member access. I kind of thought, I thought about it and basically said, I think this is the easiest way to understand it. Should, should there be a way to, to opt into making every implicit access go through operator dot? Um, not every, at least ones that you say you want to allow that or something. Well, why not just define the, the, it only applies to operators anyway, so why not just right, do this? Why not, why not, if you want these special to work, why not just overload them? I don't need this language feature and then I have to decide, okay, by the way, if you're looking for an operator int, uh, is it valid if the, re if the re operator dot uh, instantiated with operator int doesn't actually return int? Well, well it's sort of more than that, you know, because you may have a list, a template metaprogramming list of things that you want to allow it to convert to. Mm -hmm. So, with being a compile time list, you're not going to be able to just uh, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Like if I want to allow for operator dot mm -hmm. to um, give me implicit conversions to these particular things which are defined in these strings which mm -hmm. were computed at compile time. That yep. seems like that would be... So you want basically, I've computed at compile time a set of types and I want to allow conversion to those but not others. And you want to do it through, op o through operator dot. Right. But well, not just a set of types. Is there a set of strings that represent these types? Because these strings are created in Strings that represent types. That's a huge problem. Because you have type defs and you have mm, template specialization with, with default arguments. Like, if I want to allow conversion to standard string, um, what do I call that? Is it what is the string for that, right? Is it uh, operator string? Is it operator standard string? It is operator standard v1 string, which is, for example, in libc++, the real name of string. Or is it st uh, operator standard v1 basic string, care allocator, care traits? What's the right way to do that? It's, it's very complicated. And Um, sorry, complicated than... If, you know, if you're trying to figure out what the return type is going to be, yeah. or the operator, whatever, then it can be the same thing as if you would type it by hand, just in a string form. And now we just type all <laughs> <laughs> so if you So if you want to conversion, um, so, so how is that more complicated than trying to figure it out a different way? If you want, if you want conversion to a set of types, Please compute those types as types. <laughs> or if you don't, there should be a different language feature that says, here's a string, give me the type for that. Right? Do a lookup and give me the type for that. And then you can do a templated conversion operator 
have your list of strings, do a transform on that to get a list of types, and use that list of types to restrict your templated conversion operator. I think that's just easier. Um, Steven, you, you had your hand raised several times, or? Okay. Uh, can I ask, just back up and ask a really simple and I suspect stupid, ignorant question here? Please. <laughs> In C++ 98, yes. you simply cannot overload the dot operator, isn't that right? That's right. Okay. So you, in 98 or in 11, you... Oh, oh, one more. In C++ 11, what is the rule in standard C++ 11? In C++ 98, 03, 11, 14, and this probably 17 either, you cannot overload the dot operator. That's what I thought. Then why are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> because you can't do it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so you didn't say at the beginning, oh, I've got a, a compiler that's supported. No, I actually, had, I actually said, okay, you, okay, I, didn't, I didn't have that feature anywhere. I, I said, I want this feature and I implemented it. Ah, okay. I, I thought when you started that maybe 11 actually does support it. I didn't know. No, no current version of C++ okay. supports this. Good, thank you. Yep. Just to come in on that, but I think the goal is to get it in the stand. Well, to figure out whether it The goal is to figure out whether it's a good idea to do it. Yes. If it is, then get it and if it is, then we want it, I want it in the standard, right. Okay, so now my question. So you're saying that the operators don't go through the dot operator overload. But Implicit accesses don't go th through the... Okay. Yes. Well, it seems to me that, an, an ex that, for example, if I have a normal function, not an operator, mm -hmm. then it will always go through the dot operator. If you have a normal function, it will... If a normal member function will almost always give her a dot operator. I have one more case down there that we should look at, in which case even a member function or a data member access might not go through that. Like for example, a, 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 a pointer, the, the arrow. Mm -hmm. But my point is that it seems like a bad default to me because there is no way to call this function. I don't understand why is there no way to call it. If I have if I have a member function and accesses always go through the operator dot, then there's no way to call my actual member function. Yeah, yeah that's that's the topic of escaping that comes after this section, right? So there's also escaping. Yeah, that's also esca it, the question is how do I call um, how do I access a member of something that overloads the, the member access operator, Mike? There's already a built-in meaning when the, uh, when the left-hand side is a, is, a, is a class type. And what you're exploring is when it's, when, when it's different, I believe. This is the context where you're going. Um, you system. can't overload member access because uh, every class already has a meaning for member right. access. That's yeah, it's the same right. thing as with the address off, off operator, right? And the comma operator. Right. So I think this is only exploring what, what else you can do with them when they're not. No, I'm actually overriding normal, normal member access with that. So it would be perfectly valid to say why ABC, assuming why has an why has a mem uh, member called ABC, even if it doesn't overload the DOP operator. But the moment why overloads the DOP operator, I override that. I get rid of the normal meeting. And yeah, Chandler. I think it'd be really awesome if you could finish these slides. <laughs> <laughs> awesome if I know. okay. Let me go on with the slides. Right. Um, Right, this one. This is basically the same as this, right? So we, we want to access, we get, want to go through the dot operator. And the last line, so X has a member called I. Do we access that member or do we access the dot operator, right? So it's an unqualified name, an I. What happens when it looks it up, right? The first thing it does, it, lo it looks for local variables. If it can't find any, it looks in the class. It goes through the hierarchy, it looks through the base classes. And if it can't find anything there, then it looks in namespace scopes outside the class. Roughly, uh, there might be some inaccuracies there, but this is roughly what happens, right? Um, so let's assume I have code that looks like this, right? I have a class X and it overloads the dot operator and I have a member function Fn and in there I want to access this global. Um, what does that actually mean? Well, look it up, that name, right? Um, local. There's no lo local variable called global. Um, good. Member. 
Is there a member called global? Well, there's an operator dot. Right? We can do it like this. <laughs> Is, do you think that's what the user wanted to do here? <laughs> I don't think so. If that implicit member access is, is go through operator dot, then he'll have to do this, just to get at the global variable. Here's an even more nasty case. Um, I love this font, by the way. There's about three pixels difference here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh. This is local. This is loca1. <laughs> Oops. So, look it up, loca1. No, we don't have a local variable by that name. Obviously, we have a member because we have an operator dot, right? S Stephen? So, I don't see that this is any, this particular problem is any worse than what you get when accessing something direct, explicitly, and you have to have, a, and you're trying to access a member, but you mistype it. Why is this any worse than if I have an, then say if, there's, if you're trying to access a variable that actually exists there, but you mistype that. Um, okay. So you say y dot a, b, c. Mm -hmm. and, and I mistype that. Okay. Well, you're trying to access a member that actually exists, but you mistype it. I don't so so why is this different than if, if, if y has a member called a, b, b, and I just mistyped here as a, b, c? Well, even if y has a member called abb, this will still, even if I typed abb, it will still go through the dot operator because this is an explicit access, right? The difference here is if there's no dot operator, this, it's the expectation, right? Um, here, if I don't make the typo, I access this local variable here. And just because I made the typo, I sud I'm suddenly in the, in the dot operator. That's the difference. Because it's basically the same as dereference this dot i. But you also says if I define the um, the arrow operator is different. Uh, so why is this different? Why why would I go through the operator dot here? Is that a question? Forget the arrow operator. It works in a different context. It doesn't really have anything to do with the dot operator. This is, this is a pointer, a built-in pointer type. The arrow is equivalent to dereferencing and then saying dot. Yes. The, ar the arrow operator, an overloaded arrow operator, is only relevant if you use the arrow on an object. Yes, I know. Um, my point is, I know this causes no ambiguity, but um, that does not look explicit. Well, it's an explicit member access to me. Um, I mean, that does not look uh, like an explicit use of dot. It, it does not look like an explicit use of dot, that is true. I, I decided to go for explicit member access and not explicit use of dot. So, so I think um, it is okay to just force user to try to use a star at the beginning, the reference it and use a dot explicitly, literally. You think it's okay to force the user to I, literal I the dot correct. to dot? Um, I hope the syntax is it's correct. it's an op, it's an implementation option. I went I went for my way because I think it's more natural. But uh, I mean that's the point of implementing this. Myself, it's, it allows me to to look at what are the consequences of various choices. And I originally I actually had it that this went f didn't go through the operator dot, and I just thought that's I don't want it to do it this way. I went for this way because I, while doing a few use cases with that, I thought this is easier to use. Tony? I think we have enough problems already where you can overload less than and greater than to be different. I mean, we, we, can, we can allow you to do the wrong thing so that people go, this should be the same, right? But it's not in one case. So we think that dot and, and arrow, arrow and star dot are the same. So if you open up another door for us to make them not the same, we get more of the same problems we always have. Yeah, so Tony says, if, if we allow the user to make a distinction between dereference and dot and just 
use arrow, that just brings more inconsistency to the language. And I, I agree with that. Yeah. I just want to make, give you a reason why you need to pass this pointer access operator through doc. Because there's no way to overload it. And that means you won't be able to basically provide the doc overload for it. Yeah, so a reason, another reason to, to pass it through dot is because if I don't, then there's no way to capture this so basically as, as an expression. Yeah. Yeah? Um, I don't think the consistency argument is uh, sound because this is already consistent. So, if th may I interrupt you? It's, it's, an, it's an important topic of discussion, but I think I should go on with the presentation and we can discuss this after, right? right? Yeah, take it offline. Uh, Stephen, any, anything? I was going to say the same thing. Okay, Chandler? For the, for the recording, could you clarify what it is that's going to be taken offline? Yeah, so the discussion whether should access through a pointer go through the dot operator of the underlying type. That we should take that offline because kind of hope to be further along by now. Okay, um, so local variable. If I make a typo, I go through the operator dot. I don't want that. So, no. I don't want implicit use, I don't want unqualified names to go through operator dot, ever. And that answers a previous question by you, I think, is there a case where member function call does not go through operator dot? This one, right? If I use it unqualified. Uh, no, it doesn't solve my problem. It doesn't solve your problem. I just said there's a situation. Okay, next next section. A uh, few comments about strings. I'm going through this a little fast because I don't think it's that important. So uh, the way I implemented is this T string is a built-in type, and you can use it in any template. It doesn't have to be operator dot. I can just make a free member function, a free template function fn. It has a T string argument. I can output it, then at runtime, I can call this with explicit uh, passing the member argument, uh, the t string, yes, David? So, so at runtime is a pointer to char? At runtime, this will be the stringlet, basically replaced by the string literal that was passed to the template. It will be char array, actually. So you can do all the user template stuff, right? You can specialize this function. I can make a specialization that for, just for the case where I pass the string one, does something different. I can deduce the string out of a type, say some struct is a, is a template struct that also has a t-string argument. I can deduce the string out of that. Um, so t-string can only be used as the type of a template parameter. You cannot declare variables or constants of that type. Um, if you have a template with that, you can pass a string literal or another t-string as the argument. In template instantiation, it's basically those T strings are replaced by the underlying string literal. And I've been lying to you. Um, it doesn't exactly work that way, as I wrote it here, because I'm not sure if it's a language e issue or just a Clang implementation issue, but basically, um, S is not a dependent of a dependent type, right? This is T string. It's fixed type. So the compiler, Clang at least, looks at the template definition. It doesn't wait for the instantiation and says, okay, um, this is not dependent. Let's see, what print do I use? Well, here's the print and it takes a care array of n cares and it tries to use n. <sighs> well, I have no idea what it is because until that string comes in, I don't know how many characters are in there. <laughs> right? So, <sighs> T string kind of needs an implicit conversion to its underlying string array, uh, character array type, and an implicit conversion to something, to a type that depends on the value of the object that doesn't exist in current C++. So there's probably a clever solution to this. I didn't go for that. Eric? Why is this any different than a non-type template? Why is this any different than a non-type template parameter? Well, it is a non-type template parameter, the, but the point is um, I don't know the type of the character array that this will be. I don't know the value, right? So 
maybe there is a clever solution. Maybe it's actually just uh, an, an artifact of the way Clang does this. I didn't care. I went for the hacky solution and said, okay, if you want the character array, make it explicit. If you want to use this as a character array, do this. And there's no rhyme or reason to this. It was just said, okay, so I pretend every T string has a member called Cster. And the type of Cster is, is really dependent because that's, it's, it's going to be a char array of however many characters. And now this, thing, this expression is type dependent, so the compiler won't try to look at this at definition time, but only at instantiation time. And at that point, that expression is replaced by the string literal, and everything's fine. Clear? All right. Next big issue, operator names. Um, so I said, OK, um, implicit use of operators does not go through um, operator dot. What about explicit use? <laughs> what if I do this? I mean, this is an explicit use of dot, so it should go through operator dot. But I chose to represent the member by a string. So I have a space here. Do I pass that along or not? What is the canonical form of an operator name? And, and Clang is fun that way. As, as and Richard explained to me how you can have a user-defined suffix of if, even though if is a keyword. OK. Yeah. So Clang ha can have user-defined suffixes uh, that are keywords. Because, you know, because it's double quote if, not double quote space <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. What about parentheses? Parentheses? Uh, no. So the, uh, what about these parentheses? No. This is a member access expression, and this is a call of that expression, right? So I completely punted on that. I said, I don't care, I don't want that, and I'm not interested in doing it, so what will happen is that the compiler will crash. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I don't know. I haven't tried. Um, but one thing is, if I used an actual identifier or name type instead of strings for that argument, that wouldn't be an issue. right? Because if I say operator star, that's operator star no matter how many spaces I put in there. Um, so you go first. A simple solution would just say that operators, whether explicit or implicitly called, never go through the dot operator. I could say that operators never go through the dot operator. I could do that. Uh, I just don't think it's useful either way. I, I haven't found a use case where I would want to use an explicit mem uh, operator. So for my experiment, that was good enough. Chandler, yeah, you still? You go first. Okay, Xiao. So I have to use the explicit operator name if I have an argument I want to pass an initializer list yes. because the syntax doesn't allow it on the right hand side of an operator. Yes. Right. Sometimes you have to. You have to? I haven't, I haven't done that, but well, maybe. Okay. The point is, what I'm doing here is kind of experimental implementation and not get too bogged down into such details. I mean, these are details I note, I note, I note when I implement this and say, okay, so if I want to turn that into a real standard proposal, I will have to deal with this. But right now, I just want to see, is it use, can I do useful stuff with this? And for that, I don't need to care about this detail, right? So this is something that we can think about once we have said, okay, we actually want this feature. If we say, well, for the simple use, for this feature is not good enough to do what I want, then why should I bother about these details, right? Uh, just anything else? The t-string feature in itself seems like a very useful feature. T-string in itself is useful. Yes. That's why I just chose this way and not the identifier way. Absolutely. Uh, so if you're um, embedded in data that you're trying to access with 
mm -hmm. as a function of the test parameters, how the parameters will be passed. If I do a member function call, how do I pass the parameters? I don't. The member access is separate from the call. First you go through the member access operator to resolve this part. And then you use the call, call expression on the result. Right? Okay, now we get to escaping. Right? So okay, let's go back to the JSON example. It has an op overloaded operator dot. And it also has this member function, as string. Right? It returns an optional string. And if that JSON object is actually a string, it returns that, otherwise it returns nothing. But how do you access this? Right? So here's a few ideas of how we could access it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's an old proposal, and it was still an N1000 number, so it's very old, um, written by Doug Reger and a few other people. Uh, to overload the, the dot operator in the old way, and they had a few of those, right? This is a stupid idea of mine, like, if I use an identifier that is prefixed by a dot, then don't use the dot operator, right? Whatever. Um, maybe go Shihao's way and say, okay, but the arrow is not, does not go through dot operator, so I can use this to escape. Um, that doesn't work for me, right? Same thing, basically, but say, okay, only if it's this that I use the arrow operator on, then don't go through dot. So the, within, within members, at least, I can go through my members, right? Or I can, also within member functions of an object, I can get past the dot operator by using unqualified names. That actually works in my solution. But it only works inside. <laughs> There's a horrible way, right? <laughs> You take the address of that member and then use dot star to access it. That would work. It's just not useful, especially if that function is overloaded, right? Or introduce an escape keyword, wrap that around, and then say, okay, if in this expression a dot a, a member access does not go through the dot operator, right? So your, your dot operator takes precedence to a normal member function. Yes. Um, my dot operator takes precedence over, me over normal members. And, and I don't know if you already mentioned this, but what was the reasoning for doing that instead of just like putting that your dot operators if there is no member function? Why don't I just call the dot operator if name lookup into the class fails? <sighs> because I don't want private members to interfere with the public interface of the class, which is every member you try access to m on me go through the dot operator. <coughs> And I don't want, oh, yeah, now I have a new private member that helps me implement, and member ac the member lookup would find that private member, use this, and then say, okay, um, well, go through that, right? And then fail because that member is private. I want, I want if there's a public operator dot, I want the interface of that class be everything goes through that by default. Chandler? You already have uh, syntax which is used in other places of the language to disable a certain aspect of name lookup. Wrap the name in parentheses. So you could write J dot open parentheses, two string, close parentheses. Another option to do this is J dot open parentheses, identifier, close parentheses. You use this for names to disable ADL. You use it for it's another option, yes. Member access to disable the operator dot. Yes, it's, it's an option, right? Um, <laughs> so? Uh, JSON, for example, if you JSON, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to parse a uh, entry with a name size, mm -hmm. and if you JSON uh, class, there's also a size, it, it just cannot be parsed. Uh, you probably don't want this. Yes, yeah, so it, it's another, it's another counter example to, to saying, okay, if, if only if the name isn't found, go through that. If in my JSON thing, I then have a uh, a value called size, I can't access that anymore because maybe I have a member in, in, in the JSON object that is called size that says how many members are there. David? Is there any other use case besides um, private members? <laughs> is there any use case besides private members why I don't want it? Well, I don't know. 
Well, I would argue that this thing about private numbers is not so important because the person who is defining the operator dot also has control of the private numbers and can, and you're already doing something special, so that's kind of odd. So you can make your private numbers so they're not going to interfere with anything. Um, it's not that important that the private members could be in the way because the one who overloads the dot operator can also just choose weird names for his private members. It doesn't work. Either. It doesn't work because what name would you choose that the user cannot say, oh, but I want that. Right? So and Tony? Just your JSON example. Yeah, in my JSON, JSON example, JSON how? Uh, the there's no name that I, can, that I can use for my private members that couldn't be a name for a member of the JSON. Well, another option would be to just specialize your dot operator for, for the size, say, member or empty member and then declare it defaulted or something. I could specialize for size and then declare it defaulted to go through normal. So it's an interesting scale. idea, but. I mean, you're, you're already, as, as, as was pointed out, you're already doing something. Yeah, so. so it's a special. I just have another idea of how to do that, and that was actually also in that old paper, but I discovered that afterwards. <sighs> I could just separate out the member function that I actually want to call. So I have a base class that contains the actual member functions, right? And I have a derived class that contains the operator dot. And now if I want to access an actual member, so I have here also a type dev that says, okay, and this type is my no dot type. And if I want, I have this no dot function, and it just returns the argument, implicitly converted to the base class, no dot, and this one is of type JSON no dot, which doesn't have an overloaded dot operator. Right? Basically, I'm forcing my users to write code like this. Yes. And it's particularly, I'm, I'm forcing my, I'm forcing the people who want to overload and operate a dot to follow this pattern. So, yes, built-in escaping way has the, has the advantage, it's automatic. Of course, this no dot pattern has the advantage, I can say, no, you can't access my normal members. I don't want you to, right? If there's a way to escape, I can't do that. Built-in does not, not require any additional code with no that you have to write boilerplate. Um, with built-in, I have to come up with some syntax for escaping, no matter how nice. No that is a pure library solution. And, well, there's a lot of ways. So it's, 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 it's kind of an opportunity for bike shedding. Like, what is the right way to escape names? And, uh, no dot requires inheritance, which might also conflict with what are you doing, maybe. So, in the end, I went with the no dot pattern because I don't have to implement that in a compiler. <laughs> 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 All right, half an hour left. Oh, that's not good. Let's talk about the actual implementation of the use cases that I presented. So. The three use cases I presented at the start are representative of these three general patterns that I found, right? There's proxy objects that just want to forward to another object. There's expression templates where I want to capture the member access and use it later somehow. And there's fake members where I do something completely different with the name, right? So proxy objects, here are a few. Flyweight, as I mentioned. Shared ref, maybe, right? It's like a shared pointer, but it uses member syntax if we want that. I have heard requests for that. Uh, boost value initialize, this is sort of wrap, is similar to flyweight, the wrapper, and currently you have to access the data member would profit from this. Uh, Adobe source library style copy and write wrapper. Also, now it's this read access and write access. You could just do the read access, you could do it through an, through an op overloaded member operator, right? Locked ref that holds a mutex lock. There's lots and lots of opportunities for proxy objects, and they all need the same boilerplate code. They have to overload the DOP operator, which is non trivial, actually, it turns out, and they have to overload all the other operators too, because the implicit accesses don't go through the DOP operator. So let's build a library that contains all that code. 
and it ha is basically a class called proxy and it is a policy template parameter that says okay and what actually happens on access so you basically write the policy that says okay this is the actual type that I want to access and here's the function that you call in order to get a reference to that so in the case of flyweight flyweight policy would contain a pointer to that one object that has the value specified says okay this T is my rep type and to access it um, so now here I have a forwarding constructor for the flyweight which says give me the global object factory and look up an object that is constructed with these parameters and it will somehow give you back a pointer to that one object and if that object already exists if I already have a string with the contents input then it gives me a back a pointer to that string and the access function basically just dereferences that pointer and now I have a template Elias that says flyweight is no longer a class template itself but it's a proxy with the flyweight policy of T right and that's sufficient if we use the proxy library that should then already be there and the proxy library is a little more complicated and that's the simple version so I have this proxy and it takes the policy as a template parameter it grabs the rep type and it stores, them, uh, it stores the policy internally it has a forwarding constructor that just forwards everything to the policy and it has an operator dot so the dot takes the member name and re so it accesses the actual wrapped object grabs a reference to that and does this and then the proxy also contains a const overload which has the exact same code letter for letter the only difference is the const at the end of the function and all the other, other operator loads so why this right what happened what happened to this this looks too nice and that's where we come back to Chandler's old question what happens when I do this right I have this dot proxy instantiated with a type that has a member function and then I try to call that member function so what it does is first it evaluates this and then it tries to call this so this instantiates to this data proxy of sum and I call the foo member so it instantiates that operator dot passes foo as a name so this t dot star name becomes t dot foo and foo is a member function you're not allowed to access a member function for any purpose except to call it because in C++ this thing does not have a proper type it's weird you cannot do anything except call it immediately right so you get an error simply put you get an error uh, and because it's actually in the decal type it's a sphenate error so what it will tell you is I can't find an overload for operator dot yay <laughs> <laughs> right so this is why we have this do access thing here right instead of doing that ref dot star member immediately I call a global free function template pass the name and pass the reference and this is what it looks like there's two overloads one is for data members and it just does the simple thing right and if that is a member if 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 that string actually refers to a member function this will fail to compile it will kick it out um, Sphene removes that and the other version looks like this roughly 
Instead of trying to access this member, it forwards to yet another thing, a simple call proxy, which is a class that stores a reference and holds a member and has a call operator. And that call operator does the actual call. I'll, you'll see that in a moment. But first, here's a problem. This one is always applies. Even if member is a data member, well, why shouldn't that still work, right? So you get an ambiguity with this if you want to access a data member. For, for a member function, this one is kicked out and this is the only one. For data members, both are valid. So we need to find a way to say, okay, this one should only be there for member functions. And the thing is, there is no way to do that. C++, you cannot do it. Um, obviously, you cannot access arbitrary members before that. But even in a temp if you have a template and it gets a type T, and inside you say, well, I want to access the foo member of T. There is no way you can say, wait, foo is a member function or possibly an overloaded member function. So I had to introduce a new thing for that. And it's basically a simple <laughs> keyword that says, is this thing a bound function? Is it an access to a member function without a call? And it returns a bool. And then I say, OK, enable this overload only if this is a bound member. Disable it if it's a data member. <laughs> and then use the simple call proxy. Chandler. Couldn't you just cause a priority between the two? Couldn't I cause a priority between the two? For example, by using, you know, uh, uh, Verard's argument to so that the one that doesn't get disabled is always the least preferred. Uh, could I use a trick to make sure that this is just less preferred than the other, if the other is also available? Probably. Yes, probably. Good idea. Stephen? Actually, all you have to do is detect whether the other one is enabled and then disable this. Um, yeah, but the problem is the other, one, the other one gets disabled by a compile error. No, it's a Sphina error. So I could, I might. Yeah, so you have to level to detect which one you want to take. So Stephen suggests another workaround where I detect whether the other one works or not. I mean, you have to have a separate thing to detect yeah. whether it's going to work. Yeah, Chandler's solution is easier. Yeah, Chandler's yeah, solution yeah. is probably... Okay, so this is probably not necessary after all. But it was fun to implement, so who <laughs> cares? Okay, this is simple call proxy. Like I said, it has... It has this... Um, takes a member, the reference type, it stores a reference, and it has a forwarding function call operator that just access the member and immediately calls it. Because this is legal. Right? And so the simple proxy implementation in complete, this is the complete code for that, except for all the other operator overloads except for, besides the dot operator, right? Um, so proxies can be of varying complexity. This is the simplest one that is just notifies an access. I could pass to that access function, I could pass the member along, I could create temporary objects that get destroyed and then call into the policy too. I can re do really crazy stuff if, if I want to work hard enough on that. So I implemented this one and I implemented this one. It's probably not worth it. I didn't find any actual use case for it, but it's possible. Okay, second use case group. Or uh, any more questions about proxy? Right. Second, expression templates. Um, here's something you can do. You can do lambda expressions, kind of like the bind that I presented. <sighs> Boost param parameter currently uses tag structs to name parameters. I found I haven't implemented it, but I think I ca you could replace that with a nicer scheme that doesn't require you to pre-declare this. Basically, anything you want in DSL, so you have new DSL opportunities with this, right? So let's look at lambdas. I'm not going to implement all of that here. Um, just the placeholder, underscore one, is... It's a class, and it has two interesting functions, like a function call operator 
that just says, okay, if I'm underscore one, which is placeholder of zero, then no matter how many arguments you give me, um, I take the first one. This is like if you say underscore one and call that, you get the first argument back. Basic, the most basic lambda piece. And it is a member access operator that returns a expression template type that says, okay, um, access this member within, within the placeholder, right? This is what access expression itself looks like. It stores the base expression, for example, the placeholder, and it has a function call operator, again, to evaluate the lambda, that first uses the inner expression, um, and then the, uses the same do access that we had previously with the proxy to access the member that is the member access that it's stored on that. And that's actually enough to do this. I have a struct data, it has a member i, I have a vector of data, I have a vector if int, and I do a standard transform for every element of this vector, put the i member into that vector. Right? If I want to extend it to bind expression, I need a lot of boilerplate code that has nothing to do with the dot operator, so I'm not going to show this here. Um, question about that? Are you still with me? Yes. <laughs> okay. So anything, if it's about expression templates, the best thing to do would be to build support into Boost Proto for that, right? Then everyone, everyone can use it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I didn't do that. I didn't look at Proto. I was kind of scared of that. Proto actually has uh, a hack for overloading the member. I know, yes. But that's, it's, it's, it's useful for different ways. Uh, so Proto already has a hack to, to kind of overload the member access operator for very specific members. Yeah. Mine is basically for anything. But if you have specific members with their specific, your way is probably easier to, to, to use than mine. It wasn't easy. To use, not yeah. to implement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this aside, I'm going to skip that because if you want to know about that, you should have gone to Eric's talk because it's exactly the same thing as his, except he has a solution and I don't. Uh, the basic problem is that once you have a forwarding template like this and you call it with something wrong, you don't get a proper error anymore. It just tells you, I can't find an overload for this because it was finite out because this doesn't resolve. But it doesn't tell you why this failed, right? Um, Eric found a great solution for that. And I, I did some, when I had to debug this, I did some really stupid stuff. I kind of tried to isolate that case and then substitute the deduce type for what I said. Okay, but this is what it should be. And then I actually get the error from that. And afterwards, like, <sighs> <laughs> thank you, Eric. I know what I will do in the future. Um, so boost parameter, this was my idea. It was a pretty late, but Basically, this is um, boost parameter has this macro called boost param name that expands to this and use it to declare. I want a named parameter called index. I want to be able to use that in my named functions. Uh, by the way, boost parameter, how many people are familiar with that? A few. So it's basically a library that allows you to use named parameters in C++. Uh, pretty complicated thing. And essentially what you have is you, you use a macro to define this underscore index thing and it's identified by a tag struct, right? And then you can call a named parameter function using print using this syntax, right? You take this underscore index, assign the actual argument value to it, and in the function you get an argument pack and you can use an index operator to access the index argument, 
It's not too bad. And then there's this boost parameter define function macro is huge thing that allows you to use a different syntax for that. Very complicated. Let's not look at that. Um, with overloaded dot operator, you could do this. Forget about the pre-declaration of that name. Just say print index p dot index. Let's say p is some kind of global object with an overloaded dot operator. p dot index equals one. And in the function, I say well arcs dot index. I'm pretty sure this would work. It would work like this um, somewhere. Boost parameters this class keyword, which currently takes a tag struct. And you could pretty much just replace the tag struct by a string tag. And then say, OK, any argument pack has an overloaded dot operator that is equivalent to saying index operator of keyword with that name. Put that here. Right? And you have this global object that represents name parameters and this expression is equivalent to this right the the, 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 the dot operator is just overloaded to, to return keyword of the name that was passed questions about that good third big group is fake members and um, how much time we have left? Ten minutes. So I'm probably gonna not do the Clang implementation part. I'll just say with this one. I think it's the more generally interesting one. Um, so here's a few ideas. Um, Boost Python has a type called object, and it represents a Python object, and it has a function called attr, which you pass a string that is the member name of, for. So to access a, a member of that Python object, you pass the string name of that object of that of that member to object.attr. Well, why not overload the dot operator and say my object dot foo? And internally that can call the attr function. Yes? You'll be limited to what are C plus plus identifiers though. So especially for JSON, for example, you could receive something called one two three. I'll be limited. I'll be limited to what is a legal uh, C++ identifier. Yes, if I use that way, but I, I wouldn't use that to replace the other way. I would use it in addition. And if it's something weird, some weird name, I can still use the other way, right? Um, as I said, JSON and other data formats, you can use the dot operator to access those. <sighs> I haven't thought it's completely through, but I think dot operator would give you a way to implement these properties. Like it looks like a member, but it really is an underlying line getter and setter function without any overhead. Probably. I'm not completely sure. And it would be very ugly, uh, but it should be possible. Tuple with named members. <laughs> because, right, that, because we want that, right? <laughs> For example, or use your imagination. I mean, there's, there's so many things you can do with that, right? So name tuple members. <laughs> tuple of int and string. Oh, and that int is called key and the string is called value, right? Could be the value type of a map. And I can say v, v dot key is zero. And then use get a zero to get it out again. Both both are possible, right? They're equivalent. Um, here's how that works. Uh, here's a very 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 basic implementation of tuple. So I have some helper stuff. Uh, this is basically just capture and an, a constant integer in a type, capture a string in a type, and the tuple base. Right, it's got an index of my member, and it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a trail of the members that it wants. So here's the term. It's a recursively defi defined type, right? Variadic template. You always have recursion there. So this is the termination. If there are no types left, I have this tuple base. It's 
basically empty except for the do get function that does nothing. Here's the interesting case. So I've got the, the, the first the first argument is of the form n of some string and int, right? Here n and string and str uh, string and type, and there's more stuff behind that, right? Uh, we derive from the next one, which is these get passed on, and the index is one higher. Uh, we have a constructor that just forwards. That's not very important, and we have these do get overloads, right? So we pull in the do get of the overloads of the base class, and then we have one that takes this int marker in with my index, right? So for the er first first element, for the tuple base that holds the first tuple element, that's zero. The second has one, and so on. And there's also an overload that takes this string thing, and for the f that might be key. Here, this might be key or value, right? And then we hold the actual data. And now we have this tuple no dot class that starts the recursion, right? It's, it, it passes zero as the first index. It pulls in all the do get overloads. And it has this member function called get. And it gets the index you want. If I call get zero, here goes the index zero, and it calls do get, and it passes this int underscore of zero. And in my hierarchy, there's exactly one, one do get that takes an int zero. The next one takes an int one, the next one takes an int two. So overload resolution will say, okay, I want the one zero, the one that access the first member. This is how tuple can be implemented right now in a standard library. Oh, and they also have this nget member that does exactly the same trick. It just uses uh, string here instead of int. But it works exactly the same way. I, here, I generated an overload that has string key and string value here. I have these two overloads. So I just get this one. And this is a no dot version. And then I have the version that overloads the dot operator. And it says, okay, no dot type is this new tuple no dot. And my operator dot takes this name, says no, no dot of this, and calls this this n get with the name. Right? And then I have the free get and n get functions, and the free get function basically does the same thing. It says no dot t template get and pass the integer. Right? And this is what you end up with, right? That's how that works. I yes. This feature is already in 14. There is a way to name to do name tuple. No, no that's tuple types, not member. Okay. Yeah. So in 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 for C plus plus 14, you can access tuple members by their type. That's right. Here you can give them arbitrary names, even if both types are the same type, right? In a map of string to string. Uh, that I can't use the type access with that because it's ambiguous. So, fake members. The thing about fake the fake member use case is that there is really no point in trying to abstract out the commonality because these are really different. All of them. They all do diff very different things. So, you probably have to implement it yourself every time. But they also tend to be the easiest to implement. Two minutes left. Why wouldn't we want this feature? Okay, you can do really, really weird stuff with it, right? I showed it. This stuff is crazy. And you can do even crazier stuff with it. So there will be people who say, well, we don't want C++ to be a mutable language. We don't want to override what member access means. That's the one reason not to do it, right? Um, the second reason not to do it is that it's pretty much an expert-only feature. It, oh, you, you have to use template metaprogramming to use it. I don't think there's any other feature in C++ where you basically have to use template metaprogramming just to use it. Um, tuple indexing. <laughs> tuple indexing. I mean, you expand the tuple into 
yes, <laughs> doing interesting stuff with tuples requires weird stuff, yeah. And the third, the biggest problem in my opinion is that it's incomplete. It's limited to members that can be represented by strings and returned by a function. So I cannot use it to access member types because the operator dot cannot, cannot return a, a type, right? And I can't use it to access member templates because this is the member access. How do I return something that isn't? I, I can't. I can't return a template from a function. So uh, this is actually parsed as well. This is a member access and compare it to a type. What? No. Error, error, error. <laughs> the C grammar is ambiguous in this case. And even if I put the template keyword before that to disambiguate the grammar, I still cannot return a template. Right? So the main problem is that it's incomplete. I cannot fully proxy everything. If I use the proxy pattern, I cannot forward accesses to member templates. And I think that's a big problem. Right, so what did I learn implementing this? First, you learn a lot from implementing a feature. You learn a lot about that feature, what works, what doesn't work. And you learn even more when you then try to use it. Um, uh, I spent several months on this and uh, it went through a few iterations like finding out, okay, I need this isbound function, now finding out I don't need it, great. And the third thing that I learned is basically C++ is not very uniform. We have these, all these different things. We have templates and types and values and they're completely different and the fact that they're different is a problem once you try to do really generic stuff, right? And the simplest thing, that just the unalterable type of a member closure. If I do x.foo and a foo is a member function, then x.foo, I cannot store that. Overload set, if foo is an overloaded member, what, what would be the type of that, right? So that's, that, mm, you could e more easily do complicated stuff in C++ if, if C++ itself was more uniform. All right, questions? Yes? I'm not sure if you ever touched on this, but um, have, have you considered how the compiler would handle virtual object references? How would the compiler handle virtual object references? You can use the dot operator What's a virtual object? Well, so So I think the, the question is what what happens if if I've tried to use it to access a a, a, a virtual function? I guess my impression was yeah. So like if you had a virtual object, how how would you would it wouldn't make a difference. It really wouldn't make a difference. You wouldn't be able to identify which object you're referring to, right? Because it's virtual. Maybe I'm confused. I, what, uh, what he's asking about is if you have like this er dot or this arrow uh, face colon colon blah. I think. <laughs> yes. Qualified names are another thing that I forgot to mention that is really problematic. Yes, so what, what if I have, to repeat Stephen's question, uh, what if I have foo dot base colon colon mem uh, function name or member name, right? Chandler. I may regret saying this. <laughs> it seems like you could solve a lot of the uniformity problems that you're getting at um, by going back to the idea of an identifier instead of to represent these things, because if you don't make an identifier, right, yeah. make the name, it's actually have the language feature include the ability to parse and represent a qualified name, including the qualifiers. You can even have it have the ability to parse a template name and do special things so that you can actually make templates and other things work. Right? By actually by moving away from strings and toward a more structured thing, you could you could actually make the language extension be a more you know complete 
language extension because you can teach that thing about the structural pieces that don't fit well into a string model. So, basically, if if I use if I use a name type instead of a string as the argument to dot operator, a lot of my problems would just go away. Yes, they would. Not all of them. I don't think it would solve the problem of template names actually. So, so will those templates end for all those sets? The, it requires a secondary thing, which is you know adding the ability to forward the template or the overload set. Right? Yes, we would also need a way to forward templates or overload sets. Yes, exactly. Um, but yes, it would help. The thing is, I presented this like I thought, okay, do I use an identifier or do I use a string? That's not what it did. I said, hey, overload member operator, and hey, let's pass the name as a string. Cool. And now we have template strings too. And at some point I thought, well, <sighs> maybe I should have used an identifier there. Now nah, I already implemented it with the string. Forget <laughs> it. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> I can restrict the string to be identified. Yes, but I don't think that's more useful. Uh, maybe. Well, it, it, doesn't solve, it doesn't solve any problems, right? It doesn't solve the problem of how does an operator name look like? How, how do I use qualified names? That it doesn't solve these problems. Anything else? All right, then thank you.